This last presentation uh, by Meg Johnson Ducom, who is a PhD student here at the University of Bordeaux Montaigne. She uh, did a uh, master's degree um, here as well in religion uh, and society. She also has a master's degree in English. And she studied before that at the University of Kansas and has a Bachelor of Arts in philosophy. So we leave uh, with Mac the field of literature, but we stay in the realm of religion uh, with her um, presentation entitled Disparity Between Lack and Abundance in the U.S., A Current Moral Crisis and a Solution uh, to this current moral crisis might be offered, as it will be argued by Meg, by uh, Reverend Barber that she will talk about in more detail just now. Thank you so much. Thank you to the organizers for this conference. Thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you all. And thank you all for being here this morning. I know we're nearing noontime, so we'll try to end with perhaps something which can draw upon what you've heard up to now from my previous colleagues here. Okay, so we go forward with this button. Is that correct? This one? This one? Okay, great. Abundance is the profusion of affluence, of wealth, and of plentifulness. With almost 10 million square kilometers, the United States is the third largest nation in the world in terms of surface area. It is also the th in third place when it comes to population. 330 million people live within its borders. According to the World Bank, it has far and beyond the most vibrant, powerful economy in the world, with a GNP of almost 21,000 billion, whoops, sorry, 21,000 billion dollars in 2020. In fact, a trillion is thousand billion. And this is during a year marked by economic crisis due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It would thus seem the ultimate nation of abundance with literally millions of millionaires, almost 22 million millionaires, according to the 2021 Global Wealth Report. To note the profusion of affluence, the excessive amount of wealth, the lavishness and exuberance of style, we have but to turn to the popular cultural streaming from the United States to devices around the world in the form of one of the longest running reality television series in the United States, Keeking Up with the Kardashians. Kim Kardashian alone is worth $1.4 billion. The reality of life for the vast majority of those living in the United States is, however, nothing like the abundance of the Kardashians, and nothing like the millionaires who only represent 6% of the population. The reality is lack. According to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in 2021 and the United States Census, the richest 400 Americans, that is to say, 0.0000012% of the population hold the equivalent of the income of 200 and million of the least wealthiest Americans. That is to say, 64% of the population. Between 10 and 20% of Americans live in poverty and an additional 40% can be considered as low wealth, an insecurity which touches 140 million 
Americans. So more than twice the population of France. We have an example of River Williams, 87 years old, who is a World War II veteran living in low-income housing. In fact, 250,000 people per year die of poverty in the United States. <clears throat> Excuse me. The disparity between the rich and the poor, between the haves and the have-nots, between the abundance of the few and the lack of the many, is not only an economic crisis, a social crisis, and a health crisis in the United States, it is, according to one man, the Reverend William Barber, a moral crisis. Indeed, the word itself, lack, while today signifies a deficiency, a failing or a want, originally embraced the idea of a moral delinquency, a fault, an offense, even a crime in Middle English. In reaction to this moral crisis, William Barber, along with Liz Theo Harris, have revived the Poor People's Campaign in the United States, naming it after the movement Dr. Doc the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King began in 1968, but adding an essential subtitle, a national call for moral revival. And I might add that in answer to the one thing that can save America, thinking back upon the poem that we saw earlier, there is another answer, according to William Barber, the moral revival. To understand why this pastor from North Carolina and his moral revival have been making waves in local press since the beginning of the 21st century, and in the international press, press since 2018, it is important to understand what he means by a moral crisis and how he perceives its effect on the United States overall. The lack afflicting the United States goes beyond poverty. In fact, it is only one of the five underlying elements of the moral crisis, according to Barber. William Barber's Poor People Campaign and National Call for Moral Revival denounce five interlocking features, or evils, according to Barber, of a current moral crisis. Systemic poverty, systemic racism, ecological devastation, the war economy, and religious nationalism. Regarding systemic poverty, Barber states that people should not live or die from poverty in the richest nation ever to exist. He says that blaming the poor and claiming that the United States does not have, in his words, an abundance of resources to overcome poverty are false narratives used to perpetuate economic exploitation, exclusion, and deep inequality. Regarding systemic racism, Barber and the Poor People's Campaign denounce the centrality of systemic racism in maintaining economic oppression, and they feel it must be named, detailed, and exposed empirically, morally, and spiritually. In terms of numbers, it is true that there are more white people than people of color in poverty in the United States. However, among the disadvantages associated with poverty, that is to say, income, limited education, lack of health insurance, low income area, and unemployment, according to the Brookings Institute, while 38% of white adults suffer one of these disadvantages, the vast majority, 70% of Hispanic and black people do, and most suffer more than one. Ecological devastation is something which the Poor People's Campaign observes that the poor live on the front lines of climate change and bear the brunt of costs and impacts of climate change. They claim a fundamental right to clean water, especially as 1. no 13.8 million households cannot afford it. We remember the scandal around um, the quality of drinking water in Flint, Michigan. Um, 
But they also claim a right to clean air and a healthy environment and public resources to monitor, penalize, and reverse the polluting impacts of fossil fuels. Is this possible? According to Barber and the Poor People's Campaign, yes, it is possible to have people to monitor the climate and to invest in programs, in social programs. Why? Because, and this is also true, currently 53 cents of every federal discretionary dollar goes to military spending, whereas only 15 cents is spent on anti-poverty programs. It seems important to note at this point, in view of the astounding amount of false information and misinformation circulating around the world, that the Poor People's Campaign uses reliable statistics collected by governments, such as the U.S. Department of Labor, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Defense, the National Census, the White House Office of Management and Budget, federal agencies such as the Environmental Protection Agency, as well as the International Monetary Fund, and a lot of research from research universities. The list does go on. The final aspect of the moral crisis in the United States, according to William Barber and the Poor People's Campaign, is religious nationalism. Barber has, since long before the founding of the Poor People's Campaign, denounced what he calls the distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism, which he compares to spiritual malpractice. Here, he targets primarily conservative Christian evangelicals, including religious capitalistic and prosperity gospel movements, such as that of Paula White, who is pictured here in pink, and who was Donald Trump's spiritual advisor. He also criticizes independent charismatics and even institutions led by the famous Franklin Graham and Jerry Falwell Jr. Barber says that these religious leaders engage in sin as they blame the poor and oppressed for the collective poverty and oppression. He says that they betray and misrepresent the nation's deepest religious and constitutional values and insists that the primary moral issues of today must be how our society treats not the rich, but the poor, those on the margins, women, LGBTQIA2S plus people, workers, immigrants, the disabled, and the sick, those who have not succeeded, but those who have been rejected, not those who profit from the abundance, but those who suffer from the lack. Barbara holds that traditional white evangelical morality that claims to care for the souls of people while destroying their bodies and communities is deeply immoral. As you may have noticed, the moral crisis described by Barber's sounds resoundingly like a political platform. And while Barber means, maintains that he is neither left nor right, Democrat nor Republican, his demands and those of the Poor People's Campaign seem extraordinarily similar to those of the progressive left. So why would a pastor from an institutional church, the Disciples of Christ, be so well situated to initiate a moral revival involving political issues? There are several answers to this. The first one being that the United States has a tradition of mixing politics and religion. The Constitution does not prohibit the presence of religion in government. It guarantees that the government will not establish or impose any official religion, thus allowing for the free exercise of religion anywhere. Which explains why Barack Obama can swear on the Bible, or rabbis and imams can open up Congress with prayer sessions. Barber also comes from a long tradition of religious revivals. His own institutional church, the Disciples of Christ, along with the Church of Christ, both of which are a break from the Presbyterian Church, 
Organized in 1801, the iconic event that marked the second great revival in the United States, the camp meeting at Cane Ridge, Kentucky. Furthermore, Barber is also a part of a long tradition of black pastors who have been involved in political battles for social justice. We can mention John J. Jasper, the 19th century Baptist who was also an enslaved person, Martin Luther King from the mid-20th century, and of course, Jesse Jackson from the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st. Barber thus calls upon the founding documents of the United States as justification for his movement. He says that it is the deepest religious and constitutional moral commitments to justice which motivate his movement. Moral commitments enshrined in the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. He remains, however, highly religiously driven and consistently backs up every claim to social justice with a plethora of biblical citations from both the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, and even the Quran. With religious affiliation in a downward trend over the past 10 years, around 25 to 40% today, depending upon what source you look at, and white evangelicals representing one of the largest religious groups in the U.S., you may wonder if anyone is listening to Barber's voice. They are. Thanks to Barber's, uh, excuse me, thanks to Barber's notion of fusion politics, many people are listening. Fusion politics was a notion used by Martin Luther King. It consists in the joining of many social justice movements to form a large coalition and lend more voice to the movement on the whole. So the Poor People's Pain, excuse me, the Poor People's Campaign is not just poor, it's not just made of blacks, but it's made up of all those who have at some point experienced injustice, men and women, white and black and Hispanic and Asian and Native American and all the LGBTQIA2S plus community, people of religion and people of no religion, immigrants and citizens. Barber is, as I mentioned, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, along with a white woman, Liz Theo Harris. Barber was very effective in implementing his fusion politics Beginning at, the be beginning at the beginning of the 21st century with the Moral Monday movement, he managed to organize weekly protests against the extreme politics of the Tea Party in North Carolina with a record number of protesters in the streets of the Capitol and around the state. Who else is listening to William Barber? The media. The local press took notice at the beginning of the 21st century and since Barber has gone national with the Poor People's Campaign and his national call for moral revival, he has become a regular on the news media and also writes frequently for the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Guardian. The Supreme Court is also listening to William Barber. In February 2018, the Supreme Court struck down attempts at Republican gerrymandering. They did the same thing on February of this year, so about three weeks ago. Thanks to a case brought forward by a coalition of social justice groups in North Carolina, some of which were led by William Barber. Finally, who is listening to William Barber? Well, the president. President Biden chose William Barber to give the homily during the inaugural prayer service the day following Inauguration Day in January 2020. Barber has become, in many ways, the nation's moral consultant on issues pertaining to social justice. What legacy will he leave? Barber has been described as the second Martin Luther King by journalists around the world, including those in La Croix and The Guardian, and also by some civil rights leaders, such as Cornel West. Barber openly admits to the influence of the civil rights hero, after a failed attempt in 2020 due to pandemic conditions, Barber is calling for a moral assembly on Washington in June 2022 in the spirit of King's March on Washington of 1963 
to denounce the moral crisis and offer solutions to save the heart and the soul of democracy, to deplore the lack and share the abundance of the nation. Time will tell if he leaves the same legacy, but for now, he is certainly a person to watch. Thank you.